we're focused on education as an essential lever for dramatically improving education and life outcomes for underserved children. Our work focuses both on shaping and informing the education landscape. We do that through research, analysis, evaluation, and advising on matters of policy and practice. And we work directly with mission-aligned organizations across the sector. So that includes work with school districts, with states, charters, foundations, other nonprofits to help them drive their own impact and achieve their goals for children. I'm Jen Sheath. I'm a partner on our policy and evaluation team based in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I thought I saw on the RSVP list that we have um, someone here from CMS and some folks from Guilford County. So welcome to my fellow North Carolinians. And you may see some CMS students uh, running around in the background here as well. Um, I'm joined today by Stephanie Spangler, a consultant in our strategic advising practice, and Mary Wells, Bellwether co-founder and managing partner. Next slide, please. We have three objectives for our time together today. First, we'll discuss external factors likely to impact districts in upcoming budget cycles. Second, we'll spend some time considering internal best practices related to budgeting and financial scenario planning. And then we'll fi finish it out by considering how policy can constrain spending decisions and talk a bit about the potential benefits of increased flexibility. Next slide, please. This is roughly about how, we'll expect, how we expect the time to break down. We plan to spend a little bit less time on objectives one and three around external factors and policy constraints. And the bulk of our time really focused on those internal financial management practices. And we'll leave time for questions at the end. Uh, though certainly feel free to, to use the chat at any time if you have a question in the moment. <clears throat> Excuse me. At several points today, we'll be sharing clips from some of your colleagues in the field, some of, some of whom are on the phone, um, related to their experiences related to these topics. And we'll also be asking you to share and engage in a few different ways throughout. So heads up on that. Um, I think that about covers the orientation and logistics pieces from my perspective, um, unless there are any questions. Um, we can get started. So to start us off with some framing, when we say external factors versus internal factors that determine school districts' financial health, what do we mean? For our purposes today, external factors include things like federal, state, and local funding levels. So how much public revenue can a district access? Philanthropic investment levels, how much private revenue can a district access? And then policy decisions that are set by federal, state, and local authorities. So these would be mandates or requirements that district officials may or may not influence, but ultimately when it comes time to engage in financial management or management decisions, districts typically don't control those. Internal factors include things like your own financial management practices and processes. So what tools and processes do you actually use across your team for planning and budgeting? Your annual financial decisions, so decisions you're making within each year, as well as your long-term financial decisions and investments that extend over multiple years. And we're going to focus first on those external factors. Next slide, please. All right. Um, so as we all know very viscerally in so many ways, the impact of COVID-19 on communities and schools continues to be massive. Um, schools are in the midst of reopening with currently only about half of them returning in person and much less than half in some communities, particularly in cities. As you can see, rural districts are much more likely to be returning in person at about 65% based on the best data we have, compared to just about 9% of urban districts. And then in addition to those geographic differences, high poverty districts are more likely to be going back remotely. And while we don't have great measures of impact of remote learning from the spring yet, we do know that it was bumpy for lots of students and communities, and that continuing in a remote setting is not the ideal for most kids and families. Alongside that, students, families, and communities, including school communities, continue to feel the health and economic impact from COVID. So while things are looking better overall on both of those counts, just as a snapshot indicator of the economic picture, the graph on the right shows unemployment rates, Unemployment remains very high. Um, so we're looking at the unemployment rates um, since March. And overall, it's coming down, but it's still very high. 
And what's not shown on this graph, um, but if you kind of double click on this data and look at job recovery by different levels of wage, so far job recovery has also been more concentrated in higher income jobs. So lower wage employment continues to be quite depressed. Next slide, please. So as has happened in past economic downturns, the federal government has marshaled significant resources. As I'm sure you all are aware, the CARES Act provided double the funding um, in total compared to the 2009 stimulus last spring. But the total amount of funding specifically for education and CARES, which was about 31 billion, is less than a third of what ARA, the 2009 package, spent on education. And we'll talk a bit more about the prospects for, for future stimulus from the federal government in just a second. Next slide, please. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about state revenues. Um, the economic downturn is driving impact to state revenues. This map from the National Council on State Legislatures shows the depth of decline in projected state revenues for state fiscal year 2021. So this is based on actual revenue revisions, so public statements that states have issued to date or through September 1st which is why the data are incomplete. Not all states issue public statements about their revenue revisions. Some are required, some are not. On this map, the darkest red reflects revisions of more than 20% compared to original projections. So in those states like California, New Mexico, Colorado, Wyoming, their revenue estimators right now are projecting that they will take in 20% less in total tax revenue in fiscal year 21 than they were originally projecting. On the other end of the spectrum, the pale yellow states you see there are showing revisions of less than 5%. So I'm gonna give you a couple of big picture notes and then I'm gonna come back to the map and talk a bit more about what those state revenue revisions mean. So during the Great Recession, state revenues declined by about $70 billion in total. This past spring, Moody's Analytics, the bond rating agency with which you guys may be familiar, projected state and local shortfalls totaling about 500 billion. That's seven times the impact of the Great Recession. So I'll note that the Moody's analysis was done last spring, so it's a little bit outdated, and more recent data indicates that revenues may be recovering more rapidly than some of those most dire models predicted. So there may be some good news in that the depth of impact may be less than was feared, but there's still a ton of uncertainty. So back to the map, um, as I said before, these data are based on actions that state revenue estimators have taken and announced publicly. Um, in my experience, state revenue estimators are not a careless or, or a frivolous bunch, but they do work in a political context. So just a couple of notes here. One is that states have an interest in communicating fiscal distress to the federal government, especially kind of in the climate where we are right now. So while Congress right now is currently pretty deadlocked on whether or not there should be more stimulus dollars or what that should look like, states for the most part would nonetheless like to have more federal dollars. So they have an interest in communicating that there's a sizable problem. And then states, states also have an interest in communicating a sizable problem to their state and local stakeholders. Uh, for a couple reasons. One is it provides an opportunity to message a worst case scenario that you can then back off of, uh, which is often a more popular route than going the other direction. Um, so in other words, a governor could offer kind of a grim prognosis over the summer that state agencies are going to have to tighten their belts by 20% and then can come back at the beginning of a legislative session and say, never mind, it's only 10%, which sounds like good news. Um, so it, it can be a strategy. Um, in addition to wanting to message that way, um, there's also an interest in just preparing state agencies and LEAs and local agencies that depend on those state revenues for what could potentially be cuts coming down the pipeline. So I don't want you to hear this as these projections are worthless, they aren't. They are supported by the work of very smart economists and analysts who use valid and reliable methods and real data but they are projections, and as a result of that, they do have a margin of error. And there are reasons why communicating on the high side of that margin of error might be a preferred strategy. 
Next slide, please. So why does all of this matter so much for schools? Um, it's because of where funding for schools comes from. Um, on the left side of this slide, which is probably very familiar to many of you, we have the breakdown of school funding on average nationally. Now this varies a lot state to state and even within states from district to district. But on average, federal funds make up about 8% of education funding, so a pretty small slice of the overall pie. And then state and local funds more or less split the rest. The point is that schools and school districts are very dependent on state and local revenue. And in many states, higher poverty districts are even more dependent on state revenue specifically. And state and local revenues, especially state revenues, may be significantly affected by COVID for several reasons. Um, for one, states rely very heavily on sales taxes and income taxes, <clears throat> both of which just in general tend to be very volatile in an economic downturn. And then, you know, as you think about the specific sort of impact on behavior and conditions um, resulting from COVID, where people have been stuck at home, they're not going out to eat, they're not spending the same way, and where there's been tremendous job loss, you can, ex you can anticipate that those two types of taxes, sales taxes and income taxes, may be disproportionately affected. Now, I will say that there, there are some differences in how those taxes are levied compared, for example, to the Great Recession that, that make a difference here. And there is some early indication that sales taxes in particular may not have been as deeply hit as was feared in part because most states at this point are taxing revenue from, are taxing sales, online sales, differently or more than they were um, in 2008, 2009. Um, so some of that impact to sales tax hasn't been as extreme as it was in the Great Recession. The second reason why state revenues matter so much for schools is that unlike the federal government, which can outspend revenues, that's why we talk about federal debt and federal deficit, states cannot. Every state is required to balance its books within each year and can't spend more than it takes in in revenue. Most states have a rainy day fund, so some kind of emergency fund but the size of those varies state to state as do the politics around spending that money. So on the politics side, for example, in some states, spending rainy day funds requires a supermajority vote. And that may be challenging to secure in a more fiscally conservative political environment. Or there may be tensions around the purpose of rainy day funds, um, like questions of whether those funds should be used solely for one-time expenses or if they should be used to cover ongoing expenses. So those debates and those factors can affect the degree to which states may be willing to spend rainy day funds um, in an economic downturn. So because states can't outspend their revenue, um, a downturn in state revenue most often must translate to, de to decreased spending. And education is usually among the largest categories of spending for states, along with healthcare. So when policymakers need to find large opportunities to reduce spending, it's hard for them to avoid education. Local revenues, in contrast, most often rely on property tax revenues, which tend to be more stable in a downturn. But as I said before, in most states, these revenues are not distrib distributed equitably across districts, and they tend to be least available in districts with the most need. So all of this to say is that there are a lot of moving pieces and a lot of uncertainty, but it seems like there will be impact. But the timing and magnitude of impact on school budgets is going to vary a lot based on local context. Next slide, please. So there's still a lot of unknowns. Will there be additional federal stimulus? The House passed a bill a while ago, last spring. Um, the Senate isn't taking it up so far, and no one really seems to be able to agree on a plan, and there's a lot of political wrangling happening just in general. So there's not a clear indication either of whether there will be a stimulus or when there may be an additional stimulus, and in addition to that, there's not a clear indication of what share of any new stimulus education may receive. The second big area of uncertainty is how big those shortfalls may be um, for all the reasons we just talked about. And then finally, some uncertainty around how much the new normal is going to cost. As this group knows very well, school systems are navigating a really dynamic environment right now. 
you all are needing to support remote, you're needing to support hybrid, you're needing to support in-person, and you may be potentially supporting all three of those modes at some point this year. Those all require different infrastructure and supports. Next slide, please. So we had the opportunity to talk to some of you in the past couple of weeks about your experiences with COVID and financial planning. And I'm now gonna turn it over to Derek Ritchie um, by way of video um, from Cleveland on how he anticipates COVID will impact the financial state of Cleveland schools. It's really hard to say the impact yet. Um, you know, on the revenue side, there are um, still unknowns around um, property tax collections. Um, so, you know, every 1% reduction in property tax collection is about two and a half million dollars in Cleveland. And so uh, I don't yet know taxpayers ability to make their property tax payments. Um, still unclear. Um, state revenue um, has rebounded a little bit, but still is a significant, you know, is still significantly down from this point last year. So on the revenue side, there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, on the expense side, we are still, I think we are still realizing some of those savings because we've, you know, continued to put a hiring freeze in place. We're still limiting spending. And with the care stimulus dollars, we're pretty much diverting all spending onto that grant. Um, and so spending has been better than uh, predicted or better than budgeted so far this year. Um, however, um, there are still some pretty big unknowns on the revenue side that, um, um, you know, that could really swing that picture dramatically. Um, All right, so we're gonna do a quick poll um, asking you to answer three questions in just a second. How do you anticipate COVID-19 impacting the financial state of your district? When do you anticipate those reductions taking effect? And how confident are you in your assessment? This is an anonymous poll, so we won't hold you to, um, to your answers here, but just looking to, to get an understanding of, of how people are assessing their financial impact. You can just click on your answer. We can close the first question. We can, can we, there we go. All right, so it seems that we're, we're somewhere between significant impact of six to 10% um, and some impact uh, zero to 5% with a few of you um, in the, the worst case scenario category greater than 10%, but most folks are expecting a, a pretty, sizable, um, pretty sizable impact. Next question, please. While we're waiting for that next question, um, if you would like to share in the chat where you get information related to your to potential revenue or budget impact, that would be great. And Jen, one thing I would note from that prior poll, we didn't see anyone who answered no impact. So it, it feels like everyone expects it's gonna, it's gonna hit to some degree. And the question is just how much. Yep. Okay, so why don't we move to, to chat on the next two questions. So when do you anticipate these reductions taking effect? Are you looking at impact the current school year, next school year, or something else? Current school year, I'm seeing. Every school year, <laughs> both school years. <laughs> yeah, I think that I think that's probably a pretty good assessment based on what I've seen, um, both school years and beyond. Yep, yep. Um, the last question, um, and I hope I hope at least for those of you who indicated that you're getting information from your your state 
assessment agencies and, and official state revenue estimators is very confident, but how confident are you in your assessment? How confident are you in the information that, that you have about your potential impact? Very confident. It's good to have confidence, even if the news is bad. A little more tenuous for some of you. Very good. All right, let's keep moving. We're seeing, I think, more confidence, not so much lack of confidence, but there are a few of you who, who seem to still have some uncertainty. Um, all right, Steph, can we keep going? All right, um, so I got to bring the gloom, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Mary. Um, who can take us through what we do about it um, with through internal financial management best practices. Thanks, Jen. Um, I'm Mary Wells. As Jen mentioned, I'm one of the co-founders of Bellwether. I have had the pleasure of working with dozens of districts and probably hundreds of organizations on setting their strategic priorities and making resource allocation decisions aligned to those priorities. I'm a little bit of a finance nerd, like probably many of you on this phone call. And I think that your budget is the ultimate expression of your strategic priorities. And someone can tell me what their priorities are but then we can look at the budget and that's where we really know what the priorities are. It doesn't really matter what you say they are, it's how you make those resource allocation decisions. Um, Steph, if you can move the slide. Um, so given the context that we've just gone through, the uncertainty uh, that Jen voiced over, um, you will probably need more and different financial planning processes than you have needed um, in a typical year. And so if you go to the next slide, Steph, we're gonna talk about uh, the principles of strong financial planning and we think about it in two ways. Um, first is that you need strong processes and tools um, and that and that having strong processes really do make a difference um, in the decisions that you make and the buy-in that you have around those decisions and that all of your financial decisions really should be tightly aligned to your strategic priorities. You go to the next slide. Um, we are starting with uh, the process, and I know we do have a range of backgrounds on this call, um, and for some of you, the voiceover here is going to be really basic if you are a financial person, but I did want to sort of frame out um, high-level processes because I think, especially in times of uncertainty and tumult, um, implementing a strong process um, will help you get to a better outcome, even if you're managing towards some of those uh, more significant cuts that we, that we saw in the poll. So your budgeting process and financial scenario planning are two very different things. They both probably um, use Excel and lots of numbers and some people will love these things and some people will not. Um, but the budgeting process is one that I'm sure you're all actually very familiar with. You do it annually and the purpose of the budget is really to transform those annual priorities that you have that you've identified based on your student outcomes and your strategic plan transform those annual priorities into your in-year resource allocation decisions and then push those decisions into departmental budgets where you have leaders who are empowered 
to oversee that day-to-day -day spend, make reallocations within that budget, um, and respond to your sort of everyday normal um, things that come, come at district leaders, which are not insubstantial in a typical year, and then using that budget for the ongoing monitoring processes that, that you would typically do. The financial scenario planning, um, some districts do this all the time, some districts do this not at all, um, but this is uh, typically a little bit bigger picture. Often you have to make some simplifying assumptions in a, in a multi-year scenario plan. It typically is multi-year, and I like to think of the financial scenario planning work as and that and that model as a business analytics tool. This is a tool that you can use to drive conversations across your leadership team around different options that you want to assess. Um, so this is typically a longer term tool where you might be looking at multi-year, um, just let the impact multi-year of different decisions. Um, most of you, if not all of you in the chat said that you expect the impact on your budget to be this year and next year and perhaps for many years to come. So as you work through the financial um, impact of COVID, you are going to want to be looking at that year over year, so multi-year scenarios. And the financial scenario planning tool um, can help you look at cause and effect um, and look at a whole range of options. So um, that's, that's where the power of the, the scenario planning tool comes in, is the ability to sort of rapidly iterate on what if we did X, what if we did Y, and what if we did Z. Uh, Steph, if you can go to the next slide. Um, just really quickly in terms of best processes for each of these um, different um, processes. Uh, in an ideal world, your budget process is inclusive, it's transparent, it's predictable. We do it year in and year out. We all know the world is not ideal and sometimes, you know, the budget might drop down from above and with no real input or context. But in an ideal world, you're having conversations as you develop the budget, you're making trade-offs that people understand why you are making them. And you're doing it on a time frame that everyone uh, knows when it's coming and when they're going to be asked for input and when they're going to hear sort of what their budget is. Now, during COVID, we do expect, and I think you have lived this already, um, you are going to have to be um, more responsive, more nimble, um, a process that is probably somewhat on autopilot in a typical year is probably not going to be on autopilot this year as you make changes based on the portion of the year that you're going to be remote versus in person and the budget impact that those that those decisions have. If we go to the next slide in terms of best practices for financial scenario planning. Um, you want your financial model to be really clear. And by that, you probably want it to be driving to a specific output that you believe is like the most important one. That could be cash, if you're looking at days of cash on hand, um, or it could be your like operating income, but you want that to be structured in a way that given all the complexity that you guys have within your districts, um, it kind of comes out to a number or a few numbers that you're really looking at. What is the impact of this decision on that output? Um, it needs to be accurate enough. Sometimes financial people get nervous about about multi-year models because they're not going to replicate reality at like 100% accuracy level. That's okay. Um, what's important is that 
the model is built flexibly based on drivers like number, you know, numbers of students, class sizes, numbers of teachers, ratios for your different um, positions that you're staffing to schools and at the central office so that when you make some assumptions to test ideas like what would happen if we increase class sizes in these grade levels what would happen if we you know increase the ratio of students needed before you get that second assistant principal in your building or what have you um, those aren't always going to match a hundred percent to your dollar for dollar budget in year but it so it has to be accurate enough but it's just as important that it's super flexible so that it can be used to drive those multiple conversations. During COVID, you know, the importance of having the capability to do financial scenario planning is definitely elevated because this is going to be the foundation, uh, a really important foundation for the conversations that you're going to want to have with your full leadership team, especially in the cases where the budget cuts are significant. So if you are looking at six to 10%, if you are looking at more than 10%, this can be more than just you know numbers on a page this can become the foundation for how you have conversations about the hard choices that you're going to have to make um, as a senior team um, it, let's go to the next slide and here um, we're going to hear from derek um so i've built again even prior to this i had a model built because we knew we were facing um some fund balance issues right we were facing a cliff where our budget was going to go negative and so even prior to this i had module i had models built out that suggested when that would happen like the actual month when we would run out of money and so with covid 19 i've simply just enhanced that model to say given all these other uncertainties what is the best case scenario and what's the worst case scenario so if the state happen if you know state reduces our formula if property taxes are down five percent if you know if all of these things happen when do we run out of cash if none of these things happen or the opposite happens um you know how long can we can we extend this out and so we built in there some points where we said okay if we get 90 days out from running out of cash we have to take some actions and this is the magnitude of those actions and so i took some models that we already had and just enhanced them but enhanced them with a lot more scenarios and uncertainty um because we don't know when we'll find out if x y or z is going to happen and so um but really building those uh really building those models out and um that's been a part of changing kind of how we did our budgeting practice so we were also we've also been super clear during this process with principals union leaders board members the community you know we've we've laid our strategy out transparently and publicly that we're going to try to ride this thing as long as we can this is the worst case scenario this is the best case scenario these are the lines of these are the points where we cross the line of demarcation and uh we're gonna you know we're gonna try to do the right thing for kids and families and staff and uh, but some things are out of our hand, and so um, that's how that's how we've that's how we've done the modeling on this side. Great. Now, would love to have you all um, go back to the chat and share how regularly does your district use financial scenario planning to help you drive resource allocation decisions. Anyone want to share? We know that Derek does it all the time. Alberto says weekly.
Yeah, we've got it off and on. We've got monthly. So people are doing this. Um, and looks like doing it more often now that we're in the situation with COVID, with all this uncertainty. Steph, if we can move to the next slide. Um, we're going to shift gears and start talking about the second principle um, around making sure that your financial plans are aligned to your strategic plan and your, um, your highest priorities. Um, while often working within significant constraints, we see districts aligning their financial plans to um, different strategic priorities and coming up with different ways that they're driving to the specific outcome that they have said based on their unique context is most, um, most important. So you see that around something like teacher compensation or early literacy as a really big um, priority or um, high quality instructional materials are just some examples of how we've seen people do that. And then Steph, let's uh, go to the next slide and share what uh, Nalberto said um, about their priorities in Tulsa. One thing that I would add is, is if you're in an environment where you're not increasing revenue, then you're always weighing your trade-offs and understanding um, you're willing to do X over Y, which sounds fairly straightforward, but how does that measure up against your stated priorities? You know, your values and things you've communicated to your parents, your teachers, your students. Um, and so I think that's just a critical component to keep on top of. And so if an investment, right, is like, how do you change the terminology? One of the big things I've been work I've worked over the past few years is get away from saying costs and expenditures. It's an investment. Like you need to feel good about putting money in this specific area. And how does that then tie back? So as much as it's, you know, like uh, plus signs and minus signs, there's this whole behavior component that is just critical and how you approach it how does that tie into your values and and to then be able to defend it you're in, you need to defend your investment strategy to your board to your public to your students and so if, if you're not thinking about it that way um I think there's an opportunity to do that just to make sure like everyone's aligned and there's intentionality, you know, this is not happening because it's intentional. And, and so I think that there, there's opportunities to do that. Great. So, of course, we all know that COVID threw a huge wrench into everyone's financial planning this spring. And there are some pretty common pivots that we've heard in talking to folks around the country, which included things like a pivot in spending toward technology, meal kits, HVAC investments over the summer, and other priorities that suddenly rose in significance above and beyond what they were in February. Steph, if you go to the next slide, you know, we also have heard that even, even then, and we know, especially in times when your budget pressure is most acute, it is critical to keep your strategic priorities uh, in sight and to do some scenario planning as a foundation for making those decisions um, in terms of what path to take. Um, so let's go back to a network member. We're going to hear from Weston in Indianapolis. As a district, we were in the process of setting our course on a five-year strategic plan. And an outside uh, third-party consultant assisted us as an executive leadership team. During COVID, uh, we continued to meet on focusing on what are the strategic goals for the next five years, 2025. What is that we want to meet by 2025? Yes, we may have a difference in how we get there or the timing of when something happens versus another because of COVID. 
but the, the strong the, the strong financial planning process I believe is in place I passed that may have not been uh, you know five years ago was that all through this time frame we stayed committed as an executive leadership team as a board to to support a strategic plan process and so that development process has gone on for about the last year at executive team level teachers principals you know functional lead teams the community in, you know inputs from all around and actually thursday is an opportunity for our board and our administration to present and, and, and adopt a strategic plan years from now uh, and what we we envision the district to have uh, we, we, we envision to have a focus on rigor of instruction, racial equity, communications engagement, and a sustainable uh, financial operation. And so those four are the, are, the, are the strategic goals that we have aligned on over the course of the last year amidst, again, a pre-COVID, post-COVID world we live in, and all focused on, again, that, that number one strategic priority of rigor of instruction. Great. So the framework, uh, we're going to put you guys into breakout groups in a, in a couple of minutes. I want to just introduce a framework for how we think about um, supporting financial planning at this time. Um, give that a little voiceover, and then we're going to give you a chance to talk with one another for a good 15 minutes or so. So the framework that we are using to support financial planning, given all of the uncertainties and the likelihood of both cuts and the reality of new expenses is here on this page. On the left, we have sort of your bread and butter ways to reduce ongoing spend. And on the right, we layer on a look at moves that you may need to make um, around your strategic investments. So if you go to the next slide, Steph, you all know the primary areas that can be explored within a, you know, a district budget. And we categorize your move, the moves that you should be making and think or thinking about as consolidate, cut, delay, and shift. So the categories are all basically the same across districts. What's different is how much opportunity there is in each area for each district, um, depending on the local context. And depending on the size of the cut that you're looking to make, you may need to explore some of these moves or you may need to explore all of them. Um, and this is where the scenario planning can be so useful. So you, uh, can drive conversations across your leadership team around what does it look like to pull one or two levels levers within consolidate can you make some cuts that that um, are less painful and cause you to not have to do as much work around something else that might be a higher priority within your strategic plan Delay is always a tempting option in times like this, whether that's a capital investment, pension contribution, scheduled maintenance, et cetera. So that's a, uh, a tempting Excellent. one in the near term to, uh, to pull. And, and, and if you've got large cuts, you're probably going to have to look at that. And that's where the multi-year look is important because those things can come home to roost, as you all know. Um, further further along in the timeline. Um, and then if we go to the next slide, um, this is where we look at, you know, your strategic investments specifically. And, uh, you know, depending on where your focus is or was prior to COVID, you probably had a plan that that was focused on making your investments around whatever those priority areas were, whether it's early literacy, um, high quality curriculum, et cetera. And here again, the levers that you have are things like, well, you could still do what you were planning to do, but at a reduced scale, you could delay or stretch out the timing of those investments, or you could change the format and really sort of reconceptualize 
how you're trying to achieve that goal. If we go to the next slide, we've got a couple of discussion questions teed up for you. And we'd like to give you about 20 minutes in small groups to really dig into with, with your, your peers um, a discussion and you can talk about all of these, you can talk about some subset of these and I will put them in chat as well. Um, so, uh, you know, talk with folks about how have you shifted your near-term spending? How have you kept your longer-term vision top of mind during these shifts? Um, and then if you had to find 5% to cut, where would you look and how would that be different if you needed to find 10% or 15%? So Steph is going to put us in random groups. You should not plan to be necessarily with your own team members. Um, and we're going to pull you back at about 10 after. All right. I hope you guys had a lively conversation. Um, in your small groups. I would love to encourage anyone who wants to share um, a little bit about what they talked about to um, drop any notes or questions that came up for you into the chat. Um, we will have a Q&A time um, just a little bit later in the hour, and I'm going to turn it back over to Jen to frame up some of the ways that you might be able to, we heard in my group, some of the constraints we started talking about where you're thinking about different um, cost reduction opportunities and recognizing there are a lot of constraints in the decisions that you can make and i'm going to hand it back over to jen and she's going to talk about how you might push on some of those constraints yeah thanks mary um next slide please all right um so as mary said with some of our remaining time we want to touch on one more thing we talked a lot about external factors previously, namely focused on revenue, but we didn't talk much about policy. Um, so as you all well know, some spending decisions are constrained by policy, which can limit your financial planning options. And often those things are, are pretty far outside of your control. Um, some of the more common examples include things like policies that affect staffing decisions. So things like class size limits, staffing ratios, for various positions, sometimes compensation requirements. And there may be other things, perhaps tied to programmatic elements, like the timing of curriculum and instructional materials purchases, or things happening around assessment, um, or to operational things like fleet management, um, pensions and benefits, financial reserve requirements. Um, these kind of come in, in multiple forms and flavors. Um, and as we reflect back on the categories of decisions that Mary discussed, especially those adjustments to ongoing spending, so things you can consolidate, delay, cut, or shift, a lot of those levers may be limited by these kinds of constraints. In some cases, the policies may be well aligned with the strategic decisions that you most want to make. But some of them may also be barriers to those decisions, especially now when school is operating very differently from normal, at least temporarily in many places. So it's certainly worth reflecting on where gaining some flexibility could enable you to make better spending choices in the interest of your students, in part because sometimes a fiscal downturn can increase your leverage in asking for flexibility. Um, we have seen in some states that state legislatures in particular may be more willing to offer more flexibility and kind of remove some of these constraints when they're coming hand in hand with reductions in, in revenues. So with, on the one hand, they're saying we're giving you less. On the other hand, we're saying we're giving you more flexibility. Um, so this may be an environment where you have an opportunity to make the case for increase in, in flexibility. 
Um, so there's some questions for you to consider. Um, the first one is really about defining kind of the universe of policies that are constraining your decision making. So what spending decisions are in your control and which are not? In other words, where are the places where policy limits your choices? And then the second order question is within those, that full kind of universe, where are the places where increased flexibility could help you align your spending to strategy? So, you know, going back to those guiding principles and that framework that, that Mary emphasized around always going back to what are your strategic priorities? What are you trying to accomplish? And where can policy changes, policy flexibility, help you better align to those goals? And then lastly, how can you get that flexibility? So as you interact with state and federal leaders, what might the options be? You know, these can kind of run from temporary waivers, um, which, you know, are a little simpler to something more permanent. Um, but the key piece is the rationale. How will that flexibility potentially benefit students and enable you to meet those strategic goals um, and meet your financial constraints? So I know that some of you are working in districts where you already have a fair amount of flexibility. And in some cases, this flexibility extends down to the school level, where school leaders are in some cases empowered to make some of these decisions or at least put up recommendations um, to districts about how they may do things differently around some of these policies. Um, and I'll preview that we'll be asking you all to share in a bit about where you might need or want flexibility and about where you may have already seen the benefits of that to share with some of your peers. But we posed this question to some of your colleagues. Um, next slide, please. How do policy constraints impact your spending decisions and where would increased flexibility help? And here we have one answer from Alberto from Tulsa. Another one that is, is just thinking about child nutrition. And, and that is kind of like for the time being the vein of my existence right now. <laughs> it's super important, critical. We need to feed our students. We need to feed, you know, our, 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 our kiddos. And so then how do we support that? And we think about some of the waivers that USDA has provided and, and some of the, you know, the waivers that states have applied. So how do we ensure that we're creating an optimal environment that ensures that we're uh, providing, um, a valuable service meals and mitigating some of the back end red tape and, and point of sale transactions need to be uh, calculated or, or processed a certain way when it's like, well, really like taking just thinking about the context that we find ourselves. Um, those would be some like ideal, um, you know, if, if these constraints could be lessened for the time being that could help a long way. Thank you guys for your time and attention this afternoon. We really appreciate it. Thank you to the folks that we interviewed in advance. We've got a few of you guys on the call. We appreciate the time that you gave us. And thanks to the Chiefs for Change uh, team to, who helped get this great group together and helped shape our thinking on this.